So, what did happen in the year of our Lord 2020? And what did it ultimately mean? This is a question that, in the early days of 2021, I think a lot of people are asking themselves. And given the many events that have happened this year, I think that historians and political analysts will be trying to make sense of this time well into the future. Ultimately, not having very much perspective on the period we live in, all attempts to characterize this year, 2020, are probably going to come up short. But even now, coming right from the period in question, I don't know anybody, left, right, or center, who can deny that something large, momentous has just happened. The year 2020 was some kind of turning point, although I have a dark suspicion that in hindsight, the chaos and uncertainty it entailed will by no means be unusual going forward. On the right wing, at least, there is no shortage of people trying to characterize what just occurred. People are calling 2020 the year the mask slipped. Others are even going as far to say that 2020 was the year that America died. And to be honest, given some caveats, even that doesn't seem completely hyperbolic. But among all the people making dramatic statements about what this last year entailed, are we really learning the right lessons? Of course, none of us are going to have any grand perspective over what uniquely occurred over the last 12 months. But as always in history and politics, the goal in the game is to learn, and learn quickly, how to react prudently and effectively given what's occurring. Given that everyone listening to this video, at least at the time of the release, is going to be reacting to circumstances, taking stock of their losses over the last year, and trying to turn over a new leaf and do better, both personally and politically. Is there a way that we can look back at 2020, characterize simply what happened, and isolate some key historical and political lessons? For whatever it's worth, this video is my attempt to do just this. And while I certainly don't have all of the answers behind the enigma that was 2020, I will here provide a perspective that made the period make sense to me and try to highlight what I think we can take from it. For all of its other particular mysteries, I find that the year 2020 is quite easy to characterize from a broad point of view. Unlike other years where a great many things happened that might have had a greater or lesser impact, the year 2020 had just one grand political conflict, and only three major events that characterized that conflict. These three major political events happening continuously over the course of the year 2020, acted as sort of theaters of war to facilitate the larger political conflict between each belligerent party. Within each theater of war, the same four belligerents fought and contested for rank and power. And at the end of the event, at the end of the year, there was, there is, what appears to be a decisive victor. The conflict, in broad strokes, was a political and cultural struggle to determine who ultimately could control the narrative and the flow of political power once the ordinary mode of American and Western existence, once business as usual, had been suspended. As Carl Schmitt put it, sovereignty is nothing less than he who decides the exception, ultimately. And in a year characterized by exceptional crises, all of these conflicts lurking implicitly behind all Western political forms, came to the front in a big way. As I alluded to earlier, 2020 was less of an ordinary political year where many events happened, both big and small, and instead was a period where only a few very big political crises happened. Here I can summarize them as three particular events. The big coup, the big wokening, and the big grab. The first of these events, the big coup, as I'll call it, is unsurprisingly the emergence of the novel coronavirus COVID-19 as a global pandemic. This crisis, indeed, was brewing in the background even in 2019, when coronavirus was primarily known as a Chinese problem, a potential global health risk, and another scary 
an entirely foreign disaster scenario that most people at the time thought would blow over, much like SARS and the swine flu before it. Few people would have suspected then that the COVID virus would erupt into a global pandemic, unlike anything in most Westerners' memory for at least two generations. The coup for the COVID-19 virus was, in some sense, nothing new by historical standards. It was, basically, a virus with a high transmissibility rate, which at the time of its discovery was speculated to be transmission through asymptomatic contact, paired at the same time with an unusually high mortality rate, particularly for the over-65 cohort, which were in turn an increasingly large block of most Western and Asian countries. Once more, this was nothing unusual from a historical standpoint. In light of many historically horrific outbreaks like the bubonic plague or smallpox, COVID-19, while deadly, turned out to have very acute risks, concentrating the bulk of the deaths it's caused onto a cohort that would have, in past times, been much, much smaller. Nevertheless, the lack of information, paired with the mere speed of the virus's spread, caused almost every single rich Western country to take extreme measures to contain the virus via quarantine that would have been considered completely impossible in times past. What was initially supposed to be a lockdown and quarantine for three weeks has now turned into an indefinite state of existence, going on for almost a year and with no real end in sight. The political and narrative crisis arising from this was somewhat predictable. A set of societies in the West totally based on the ideas of liberty and personal freedom above all else, now putting the majority of their populations on some kind of house arrest where they were not able to fraternize with friends and family, and where even important religious holidays like Christmas were straight up cancelled. And for any ordinary year, this crisis probably would have been more than enough to test the system. But little did anyone suspect at the beginning of 2020, this was just the beginning. Enter next, Crisis 2, The Big Wokening. Now, perhaps this crisis was a little easier to see, given that, by this time, the Great Awakening, which by all accounts began in 2012, was well underway. But 2020 took what was a linear and constant process and kicked it into overdrive. With the death of George Floyd, ostensibly at the hands of police officers in late May of 2020, a set of massive protests and riots kicked off in America fully supported by both the mainstream and radical leftist factions. Once more, these types of racially inspired protests and sometimes riots were more or less common, especially for America post-2020, but something about these demonstrations occurring when they did and in the way they did took the existing American and indeed Western political divisions and amped them up to 11. Watching people burn down small businesses, bars, and stores is bad enough. Watching them tear down cherished monuments is heartbreaking, but this action was done on the backdrop of what was supposedly a metastasizing health crisis, a pandemic that we all had to work together to stop. Yet at the same time, none of the municipal leaders, none of even the state governors, really did anything to stop the demonstrations or riots. Now Middle America had to sit and watch from quarantine people burn churches that you couldn't visit, tear down statues when you couldn't necessarily go to a park, watching large crowds of protesters, thousands strong, some wearing masks and some not, yelling at the top of their lungs, Black Lives Matter, when you couldn't even visit a grandparent. And the authorities and the elites played ball with this even going so far as cordoning off entire sections of their cities so that anarchists and other protesters could rule them as autonomous collectives, supporting these projects as innocent street fairs, even as murders occurred and lives, black lives, were lost. I myself remember seeing an entire group of police officers kneel inside a crowd of hundreds of BLM protesters, thinking to myself to the time I tried to take my family to an almost deserted beach and found it closed. 
There were even several videos at the time of police running after interlopers who had walked on to perfectly empty beaches, chasing them down because they might be spreading the feared COVID-19 disease across an entirely empty beach filled with salty sea air. Now, for some reason, when the narrative demanded it, these rules seemed to be completely suspended. Not serious. It seemed politically that something had to change. And this brings me to the third political crisis, what I call the Big Grab. The Big Grab in this case is nothing less than the consolidation of power by the mainstream center-left in most Western democracies, but most particularly in the United States with the selection and election of a person that no one really wanted to be president. To my mind, the Big Grab really bookends 2020 because, although no one remembers it, it really did start early on, in the Democratic primary, where a candidate, Joe Biden, and a vice presidential candidate, Kamala Harris, became the de facto nominees, even though no one on the ground really thought that they were good choices. Fast forward to November and December 2020, and we have on our hands a contested election, half the country believing that the president-elect is illegitimate, and a mainstream media, and perhaps even judicial system, that does not want to take the possibility of voter fraud and misrepresentation seriously at all. Of course, the terms of YouTube prevent me from discussing the particularities of this crisis in detail, and that, in turn, is part of this crisis. But we have, in toto, what amounts to the ascendancy of a political power that nobody really wants. And looking back, in broad strokes, it seems very hard for me to imagine that these three events, the coof, the wokening, and the grab, couldn't be described as the primary, and perhaps the only real events of importance in 2020. At once, this is a little strange. Each of these events were, in their own way, unique inside of American history. Furthermore, each happened, ostensibly at least, completely independent of the other two. And each of these events, in turn, embodied a political conflict between the same four political groups, and in each case, the same pattern of events and the same set of victors emerged from the process. But wait, once again, I've gotten ahead of myself. We're used to there being two political sides in the culture war, and I mentioned four belligerents in these conflicts. Who exactly was fighting for political power in 2020? And why did the same set of patterns keep on playing out again and again? Of course, the groups that played roles as political actors in 2020 were no different than the groups that we've seen emerging in American and Western politics since at least 2012. Here I can outline them and provide some convenient nicknames. Firstly, there is the mainstream center-left, the well-to-do voice of political elites in Europe and North America and the default consensus opinion of all media, the academy, and the unelected government. The mainstream perspective embodies what is common sense for the jet-setting elite. These are the typical opinions, in broad strokes, that you'll find advanced in NGOs, TED Talks, and human resource departments. Many people on the right often call this group the globalists, whereas in neo-reactionary circles, we usually refer to this consensus as the cathedral. Unsurprisingly, the cathedral, the establishment opinion, is the most powerful of the four groups, and the one that sets the tone for the dialogue and the conversations that occur in official circles going forward. The cathedral is, of course, powerful, but it is not uncontested. And this brings me to the second group, a group that many right-wingers like myself oftentimes see as adjacent to the cathedral, but is distinct in some important ways that I'll point to in this talk and that is the general group that I will call the left. Here, the left is the classic revolutionary, and despite what they might say, utopian dreamers that seek societal change on a large and radical scale. What do they want? Well, more or less the same thing they wanted in the French Revolution, perfect equality, fraternity, and liberty. And for most people who occupy the left, this promise is long overdue, and they are increasingly frustrated with modern political organizations' ability to deliver on this dream. Again, many on the right wing see this group as something of a shadow 
or even a junior partner to the cathedral, and this makes some amount of sense, since both groups subscribe to the same dream of equality, liberty, and fraternity, and in 2020 we probably should add in diversity. Yet despite their common vision, at least their common professed vision, the two groups really don't have very much in common. One is pragmatic, the other is idealistic. One wants to justify its rule via competence, the other group sees themselves as perpetual victims. Once more, it's common for the left and the cathedral to use many of the same narratives and to use many of the same political events to bolster their cause. But usually what is going on when we dig down is a negotiation, a compromise, and a brokered peace that is oftentimes much more tense than people on the right realize. And this makes sense after all. The cathedral is the keeper of a global order, whereas the left wants to dismantle and totally remake it. Certainly, if each is honest about what it is and what it's promising to its constituencies, there is, and indeed there must eventually be, a conflict. But this conflict between the cathedral and the left always seems different and less of magnitude than the conflict that the mainstream has with the two other groups on this list. The first of these groups, the next one on our list, is what I like to call the Magapedes. These people are what we would classically call conservatives, right-wingers or red-staters, at least in America. In another era, this group would have been stalwarts of the center-right party, or in some cases, working-class and culturally conservative stalwarts of the center-left party. However, post-2012, with the corporate world, hopping wholeheartedly onto the intersectionality, diversity, and globalist bandwagon, these two groups of largely rural voters have been relabeled from conservative and grassroots activists into the catch-all term of populists. This change has been one of the most recent developments in Western politics and is something that is inextricably linked to the votes for Brexit and Donald Trump in 2016. That being said, the MAGA P group is essentially a decapitated movement, its leaders in the Tory and Republican Party joining up more often than not with the cathedral agenda, and only occasionally and tacitly throwing a political, or more often than that, a purely imagistic bones to their populist followers. Nevertheless, despite the apparent impotence of the Magapedes, despite the apparent powerlessness of populist movements both in Europe and America, there is some deep fear that these types of political action inspire in the minds of the establishment. The mainstream hates the populist Magapedes less because what they are and more because of what they symbolize about how the political world is changing around them. In fact, strangely enough, most of the political events leading up to the year 2020 largely concerned a strange overreaction on the part of the mainstream to try to tamp down and close the lid on this populist movement to prevent them from enacting an agenda that it never seemed was even a possibility not least because the populist leaders and the movements they represented lacked all focus and institutional support. Strangely enough, for a phenomenon that was seen as so globally disrupted, the Magapedes were, at the end of the day, conservatives. Whether they came from a working-class, old labor background, or whether they were middle-class, professional, stalwarts of the GOP, the mission of these right-wing populists was fundamentally to restore something that had been taken away, to get back to a past that they knew was good and that they knew would be supportive of their families and futures. And this, in some ways, sets them aside from the last group on my list, the group in which I consider myself and that I call the dissidents. Now, probably in 2019, I'd call this group the dissident right, and indeed, there is a lot of overlap. This is the group that constitutes the people that have largely found themselves politically homeless in the era of Trump, even if they did consider some of the president's goals to be desirable. However, where once this group was largely and exclusively comprised of right-wingers, increasingly the label houses refugees from the left side of the spectrum as well. Once more, the distants are politically homeless, and hold two general views of the world 
that keep them apart from the other groups under discussion. The first is an understanding of the economic devastation caused by globalization and global free trade in the late 20th century. The second is a rejection of intersectionality and an understanding that this form of ideas on the left and mainstream is blocking a larger discussion that needs to take place about the ultimate future of the human race and what defines its boundaries. Still being quite a vaguely defined group, the dissidents comprise all types of people, and you can find just as many kooks and crazies as you can find generally cool-headed rational thinkers who just want the best for the future. And in fact, this uncontrolled dynamic has given the mainstream and the left no end of opportunities to attack dissidents. As always, the message is the same. They're weird. They're strange. They have dangerous ideas and dangerous attitudes. They don't conform to the niceties we want to have around our own dialogue. And furthermore, they're so out of touch with what's been established as true by the intelligent, peer-reviewed, mainstream consensus. And I think if we take a step back, it's clear that these are the belligerents in America's culture war. These are the emergent groups in 2020, and there have been similar divisions in American politics going back at least to 2012, and much before then in American politics. And for those listening, it probably seems like I haven't done anything new. I've listed the three main events of 2020, which most people will probably agree on, and I've outlined my own version of the deep cultural and political divisions that have beset American culture. So what exactly is the missing piece here? What turns these three events, and the obvious conflict between these four groups, into a pattern of political events that seems to be repeating over and over again in 2020? Here, to better understand the situation, I think we can employ a concept from classical reactionary political theory, Gaetano Mosca's idea of a political formula. Now here, I don't want to completely butcher a nuanced concept first developed by a very thoughtful individual in the early 20th century, but to put the idea on the back of a napkin, according to Gaetano Mosca, a political formula was a set of doctrines and more importantly, a narrative that was circulated or promoted by an elite that would naturally justify the rulership or status of the elite in question. Mosca's concept of a political formula is an incredibly general form in political science, as it was intended to be. Ultimately, you can describe any political behavior or any action done by a political party as a type of political formula or at least supported by political formulas. But the general insight that Mosca uncovered was to understand the role of narratives and doctrines as they play out in power relationships. Long before leftists like Gramsci caught on to this, Mosca was one of the first to understand that raw human political power is not best understood necessarily through material relations, but also through the narratives used by various people in power. But for myself, when I think about political formulas and try to apply them to modern events, I don't necessarily see them as static doctrines or static narratives. I've always made a slight modification when I used it for my own purposes. It never made sense to think of political formulas as static narratives or doctrines. They do have a narrative form and a doctrinal form that is more or less constant. But that is not all political formulas are. Attached to them, necessarily, are a set of actions that the political formula commends, and that, through performing the actions, people can obtain and partially share in the power that the elites want to maintain for themselves. For instance, in a Catholic monarchist country, the political formula might be the majesty of throne and altar. But in addition to the story of the divine right of kings, in addition to the theology and the doctrines of the church, there also are a set of actions that people can do in order to be in a line with the dominant narrative and to obtain, in some part, power. You have to defer and respect the king. You have to follow his example and many times the fashion that he lays out for his kingdom. You have to be a good churchman and a true believer in the state religion. 
and on top of all of this, it wouldn't hurt at least to appear charitable and good. Alternatively, for a communist society, the political formula might be workers of the world unite. And under this regime, under this narrative, the actions associated might be joining the Communist Party, professing your profound sympathy for the working man, and joining a trade union, even if you don't think that trade union will materially benefit you. In this sense, under my extension of Mosca's idea, you might view political formulas as something akin to a business model. The business model shows that, with the right actions, a person can generate more income than expenses and at the end of the day walk away with a profit. As such, once a basic business model has been established, any number of private actors or franchise owners can set up and benefit from it. In such a way, it seems to me that when elites use political formulas, they create opportunities for people to participate in the formula and in exchange participate and gain some amount of status and power. This, in effect, obtains the classic exchange between the ruler and the subject. The subject gives obedience and conforms his actions, and in exchange the sovereign gives up some of his power. In many ways, the easiest way to model 2020 is as a contest between political formulas. Each of the four groups, from the mainstream, to the left, to the magapedes, to the dissidents, were trying to set up their own narratives not just to descriptively model and predict what was going on and what would occur in the future, but also to facilitate political formulas, to create narratives that their own side could use, in some sense, to support and maintain their power, both on a macro and micro scale. And with this concept of the political formula, we have the general form of all events in 2020. In short, the political battles that have occurred over the last year have had a very consistent form. When any event occurred, usually a tributary event to one of the big three events I discussed earlier in this video, each of the four political parties, the mainstream, the left, the magapedes, and the dissidents, would arrive on the scene and try to apply their own narratives to the situation, their own political formulas. Eventually, regardless of their ideological differences, these narratives would collapse into two positions, one including the mainstream and the left, the other including the magapedes and the distance. And in every instance, the narrative of the mainstream and the left would prevail, and the narratives of the maga and the distance would be defeated. On the face of things, this sounds simplistic, but the competition between two sets of political formulas with one set eventually dominating, is a very easy way to explain most of the political activity in 2020. Most of the conflicts, even though they had varying origins and varying details, had the same general formula, and the political formulas that were competing for dominance were in each case very similar. But what were these political formulas? What were these narratives that each side used? Well, to start briefly with the losers on the right, the political formulas advanced in 2020 could be broken down to about four bullet points. It first starts with the observation that the Western way of life, the traditions, moors, and communities found inside Europe and North America were good, are good, and should be continued on into the future. The second part of the narrative, the one that gave it its real kick, was that the system, and in this case, by the system, I mean the banks, the NGOs, the corporations, and the media and educational apparatus in the West had become perverted, diseased, and were an active threat to continuing the kind of life that most people living in the West, and indeed most of the world, wanted to live. The third point, making the second more specified, was that an elite power grab was in motion, exacerbating the many problems that the West America and the world had faced over the last 20 years, to the benefit of only a small number of people, and that the way this power grab was proceeding was through selective misinformation, narrative control, and media bias. And finally, since all narratives have to have endings or solutions, there is the proposition that all of this could be confronted and indeed was being confronted by a right-wing movement, by a populist uprising that was exposing the disinformation and misinformation of the elites 
and providing a real pushback. In fact, if you listened to most people on the MAGA side of things, America and indeed the West was on the verge of a complete rebirth. It was mourning in America once more. We just had to trust the plan, or trust that something would happen that was better. This was, of course, the weakest part of the narrative, but most people just whistled by it because they believed in the first three points. And I think, starting off in late 2019, a lot of people on the right, both on the distant right and on the MAGA right, thought that this narrative, in some general form, would be effective going forward. It might take some time, but people will come around and see the point that we're trying to make. 2020, however, demonstrated that there was something deeply wrong with this political formula, because it was blown out of the water by the alternative vision, the alternative narratives that were coming out of the mainstream and of the left. And the alternative narrative in this case wasn't even that different from the narrative provided by the right wing. Here, to summarize it in another four points, the alternative narrative begins with the observation that the Western way of life in its traditional and modern conception, both in North America and Europe, is bad and needs to be torn down in order for a new world, a better world, to come into existence. To this, the second part of the narrative points out that the system in place, the status quo, is upholding this system and way of Western life that needs to be deconstructed and cleared away. Here, I should point out that the concept of the status quo and the system is much more vague. Usually words like capitalism, white supremacy, and imperialism are used, but they rarely, if ever, refer to actual institutions that exist, as we'll see later. Point three of this alternative narrative is that the problem is misinformation coming from certain bad actors, usually right-wing actors, and that the solution is more expert-guided democracy, voting and popular participation, but with the caveat that experts need to be inserted into the process to sort out good information and good narratives from bad. And this brings us to the last point of the alternative narrative, and that is that experts in the academy in the media, and oftentimes even in corporations, need to be empowered to stand up as proxies for this democratic impulse, and also to fight the constant threat of misinformation from right-wing bad actors. As always, this last point pertaining to the direct solution would probably be the most controversial inside the coalition in question. However, over the course of 2020, very few people in the mainstream or even on the left, would ultimately come to disagree with all four of these propositions in one form or the other. And if we take a moment, standing back from these two narratives, I think what is really strange, and also what is really interesting, is how similar they both are in a few important regards. As per point two, both sides saw themselves in 2020 as the opposition to the status quo. There was no controversy over whether something was wrong in the system. The only controversy was what was wrong. For the radical and iconoclastic side of the mainstream and the left, what was wrong was everything about the old world, everything about local existence inside Western societies. For the conservative and loyalist factions of the Magapedes and the dissidents, what was wrong was some external force located in specific institutions. What was wrong was the economic behavior of global NGOs and global megacorporations. What was wrong were the monetary policies of banks and the misinformation accomplished by corporate multimedia and traditional mainstream news. In this way, it's very ironic to point out that while both sides had their villains, the right was much more specific about who they didn't like and where they wanted to see institutional reform than the left was whereas the right had a list of specific institutions, specific corporations, and specific bad actors they wanted to see removed from power, the left deferred instead to vagaries like white supremacy and capitalism. Concepts that I've pointed out in other videos always seem to have very vague definitions that are running away from any kind of concrete action, or even in some cases concrete examples. This vague and pseudo-religious concept on the left 
for who is really to blame for the world's problems, had many hilarious consequences, especially in 2020 when the left and the mainstream were sharing each other's narratives. As exemplified in the meme of woke capital, in 2020 you had blue-chip corporations complaining about white supremacy and sometimes even capitalism, and you had multi-billionaire CEOs giving million-dollar endowments to people who wanted to tear down the power of rich white men and the corporations they represented. This irony, of course, is only augmented by the later part of both of the two opposing narratives, where it is clear that the right, either in its MAGA form or its distant form, was fundamentally focused on removing informational and narrative control from the people who managed it, whereas the opposition from both the mainstream and the left was largely focused on returning narrative control and informational control to the people who already owned it in the status quo. Of course, this posed a sort of narrative problem for the left in particular, who didn't see themselves as any kind of maintainer of the status quo. They wanted to tear the system down. They wanted to have revolution. But as always, the problem dogs the left. If the power is flowing away from the status quo, who is it ultimately going to go to? Democracy is the usual answer. But even in this case, democracy had to be managed. Democracy had to be observed. There had to be people in charge, or at least to defend against the scary disinformation that was coming out of the right wing. And as always, there would have to be a vanguard of leaders. And what better vanguard than the people already in charge of things? And with all I'm about to say going forward, I would like to pause here to say that I do consider this to be one of the truly genius moves of the last few years in politics. The fact that the left was able to hide the narrative thread of what was going on from themselves so well. Because at the end of the year 2020, throughout each of the three major crises that went on, despite how much the left tried to explain it, despite how many radical visions they proposed, and how many explanations about how this was going to facilitate ultimate revolution they gave, it was impossible for most people on the outside to avoid the conclusion that throughout all their actions, they had done nothing but massively increase the power of government, of corporations, and of globalist bureaucracies to rule every aspect of people's lives across the globe. But, as usual, I'm getting ahead of myself. I think we can see these narratives play out in each of the three major events I described at the beginning of this video. The coof, the wokening, and the grab. To address each of these events in turn, perhaps I can start with 2020's most prominent event, the emergence and spread of the global pandemic caused by COVID-19, the coronavirus, or, in internet speak, the COOF. Ultimately, I believe as a historical fact, volumes can and will be written about the COVID-19 virus and its impact on global politics and culture. And where I'm sitting right now, I'm probably not going to be able to do it justice, even in summary. But for my own purposes here, the COVID-19 pandemic is the perfect example of the fluidity of political formulas and political narratives and how they differ from what we ordinarily consider to be predictive narratives and stories about how things actually are and should be handled. At the beginning of 2020, each of the four political sides I discussed earlier were on the opposite side of the issue that they eventually ended up in the end of 2020 the Magapid right possibly notwithstanding. In the early days of coronavirus, the narrative it brought forward of a potentially deadly foreign virus that our global health authorities were totally unprepared to confront seemed to confirm every one of the accusations that the distant right was leveling at global government, global bureaucracy, and global informational control. Furthermore, the fact that the virus spread through global trade, global movement, and global immigration, concepts that, to this point, both the left and the mainstream were holding up as sacred cows, seemed to confirm, for the dissident right at least, both the fundamental weakness of Western governments and also the ridiculousness of leftist sacred cows. 
in true hipster form, the dissidents, the real preppers, were all over coronavirus before it was cool. And mainstreamers that they are, like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, were at the time, in early 2020, assuring us that there was nothing to worry about, and having dinner in Chinatown to show that all the fear-mongering from the right wing was really overblown. And I can say for myself, as a distant personally, it did seem that caution was the better part of valor. We were dealing in 2020 with an unknown unknown, a virus that could have catastrophic impacts on Western populations, and that it didn't seem our global institutions were really ready to take seriously. It would make sense to stop international travel until we figured out what was going on. It would make sense to have an immediate lockdown until we could figure out at least how lethal the virus actually was. After all, that's when you want to be the most careful, when you have the least amount of information about a threat. And it seemed at the time in 2020, the only thing stopping us from taking these common sense proactive measures was ridiculous left-wing liberal concepts like freedom of movement. Concepts that, on an international scale, were never really even considered rights to begin with. There was no way out of this conundrum for the left, I thought, without an admission of deep hypocrisy on their part. In some sense, I was right, but not in the way I thought. Come April of 2020, the positions on each side had completely reversed. Far from locking down and quarantining as a preventative measure, as a means of getting more information, the same non-governmental apparatus, the same global health system that dithered in the early months of 2020, suddenly started to lock down hard and kick its power into gear just as we were getting more information about the virus, just as we were beginning to learn that the virus had a higher than 98% survival rate and was really only threatening to certain acute cohorts inside the population itself. As the left is fond of saying, never let a good crisis go to waste, even one that, in some sense, you have created. And by the summer of 2020, the new reality, the new normal, had become all too apparent. Lockdowns were in full effect in most populated states. The businesses of most Western countries were sent into a tailspin as entire downtowns closed semi-indefinitely, and new and somewhat bizarre mask mandates were imposed even after the experts were on and off about how effective these masks even were at stopping the spread of the virus. It seemed like an unprecedented amount of control, certainly nothing I ever expected to see in the uber-liberal United States of America. But all in all, most people, the important people at least, were behind it, both from the mainstream and the true left. At once, it was easy to see, at least from a distance point of view, why the mainstream was so fond of these new regulations. What had initially started as a brief period of lockdown, three weeks to crush the curve, had become an indefinite institution to be employed whenever bureaucrats wanted to use it. The mainstream liked it because the mainstream benefited. Furthermore, the lockdowns seemed to come down on all of the right people. What were destroyed were small and medium-sized businesses, rural areas with industries that needed large in-person interactions, and the big winners were global bureaucracies and, of course, conglomerations like Amazon.com and other internet businesses. However, what I was more surprised to see is just how willing the left was to jump on board too. Didn't this go against all of their principles? Weren't they the people who believed in freedom of movement and holding hands for a better tomorrow? Weren't they all about in-person action? And didn't they ultimately see how the effects of these lockdowns were ultimately concentrating power into the hands of large government and large businesses? Certainly the hypocrisy would have to click at some point, wouldn't it? For myself, part of the puzzle fell into place one night on Discord when debating with a leftist over immigration, and I had to hear his platitudes about the sacredness of free movement across borders when I was disallowed by my own government to go two blocks to my own place of worship and sit in the pews. Certainly, I'm not alone in noticing this hypocrisy from the left, but whatever my own experiences are, 
Certainly, America was treated to a front row seat to this left-wing hypocrisy when the next big event happened, the big awakening of 2020. Here, of course, I'm referring again to the Black Lives Matter and Antifa protests that began in the wake of the George Floyd murder in May of 2020. Of course, events like George Floyd had happened in the past, and have in fact been happening since 2012. But for some reason, in the light of COVID-19, we thought that this entire cycle would be suspended. After all, we were all locking down together. We were all in this for the long haul as a collective. No one would want to have any divisiveness. Plus, you can't protest. You can't go outside or even to the beach. It's COVID lockdown after all. But ultimately, as America saw in 2020, when it came to the mainstream or the left's narrative preferences, the notion of lockdown or safety or even philosophical consistency wasn't really a thing that they had to worry about. And what other conclusion could you draw after being lectured about how you couldn't go to the beach with your family, seeing protests of thousands upon thousands of people crammed into tight city streets yelling at the top of their lungs? some masked and some not, the assurance from mainstream authorities that, regardless of what this looked like, there was no way that the COVID virus could spread in this environment, even though the environments we were seeing on television were the exact kind of social situations we were taught to completely avoid in the months leading up to these events. And as we all expected, as any one of these protest events drew to a close, there were any number of articles and pseudo-academic papers showing that nobody could prove to a statistical confidence that these large-scale demonstration events actually did result in an increase of COVID fatalities or COVID infections, leaving out, of course, the caveat that none of the other behaviors restricted by the lockdowns, could be shown to the same statistical confidence to lead to an increase in COVID infections or COVID deaths. For anyone not totally on board with the agenda of the mainstream or the left, it was obvious what was going on. The mainstream political institutions needed their left-wing flank to stay in position, and as such, they were willing to cut them in, cut them extraordinary exceptions, and this was incredibly empowering for all parties concerned. For a while, it didn't seem like there was anything that the left could ask for that the mainstream wouldn't immediately grant them. You had mainstream city councils approve insane propositions, such as abolish the police. You had the entire journalistic mainstream coalesce around the narrative of defund the police, an equally insane and ineffective policy solution. Of course, as we all knew, America would later learn that abolish the police doesn't mean abolish the police, and defund the police doesn't actually mean defund the police. But hearing mainstream responsible people parroting your insane talking points is empowering, and this was about power. Not only power to make the left feel recognized, but also power to demonstrate that Red America, MAGA America, was completely left in the dust no exception would be granted to them or their small businesses. Furthermore, the naked examples of hypocrisy allowed for a certain kind of game to be played by the left and by supporters of the mainstream. The Byzantine nature of the regulations and the exceptions from the regulations meant that ultimately the only thing that could be done was some kind of pseudo-deference to the experts. The experts almost always coming either from the left-wing or mainstream camps, and embodying those ideological biases. Was there a conversation to be had about how to manage a metastasizing pandemic that affected a small demographic of people? Was there an intelligent way to go after reform of police and arrest procedures? Possibly, but that wasn't the conversation we were having. We were having a conversation about who the good people were and who the bad people were. To be one of the good people, all you had to do was support what the experts said about Black Lives Matter, defund the police, and the coronavirus lockdowns. It didn't matter that you hadn't thought about these controversies. It didn't matter that you had no knowledge of the ins and outs of the statistics. 
All you had to do was assent to the right side of the political opinion, and you are recognized as one of the good people. A nuanced conversation about how to manage crime and policing, or how a society is supposed to react to a disease with a historically normal fatality rate in light of increasing lockdowns, would never honestly be answered. But what would be done, and done emphatically, is the political and social censure of people who broke from this consensus. It obviously didn't help that the opposition, both in distant form and also in the MAGA form, was incredibly disorganized and uninformed. In the wake of the George Floyd protests and the increasing coronavirus lockdowns, many people on the right hopped on to factual inaccuracies, exaggerations of things that they saw to be true on an emotional level. Narratives about the coronavirus not even being real, or police brutality not being a big problem, were often heard in some right-wing circles, and this of course was used to no end, as ammunition by both the mainstream and the left. What was going on was not a moral question, was not an objection to an explicit power grab, and a cynical use of political power to benefit one side. What was actually going on was a misinformation campaign by all of the bad people, and that meant that leftists, and really anyone who opposed these scary right-wingers, had to align together, had to coalition in order to defeat all of the bad people, and make sure that America got through this all. It didn't matter that the mainstream was late to the party on coronavirus. It didn't matter that the mainstream recommendations were wrong as often as they were right. It didn't matter that the left wing was betraying all of its objectives, socially and economically speaking. The narrative worked for them. It worked politically. And so it persisted. And this brings us to the third and last event of 2020. The Big Grab. Again, as with the other two events, this particular dynamic was inverted towards the beginning of the year. The ascendancy of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, two of the most unpopular politicians in recent memory, to the most powerful political position in the entire Western world, with overwhelming political support, was accomplished in many steps. And the first step that very many people forget is the subversion and eventual obliteration of the Bernie Sanders campaign in early 2020. Again here, I won't belabor the details in a set of events that are much too complicated to cover in an already overlong video, but suffice to say that the events of the eventual 2020 election in November had a distinct predecessor in the Democratic primary. It was obvious from the outset that the voting base of the Democratic Party wanted Bernie Sanders, and really no one wanted Joe Biden or Kamala Harris, except for the elites and the donor classes that ran the party. After all, the left-wing base wanted change. The left-wing base wanted empowerment of the little guy. And it was obvious that Kamala Harris and Joe Biden would certainly deliver none of that. Yet, despite what was obviously in evidence as vox populi, at least insofar as the Democratic base goes, the result of the ballots, the results of the elections, through process shenanigans, if not through more overt means of fraud, came out again and again for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Here we could see, in isolation of the usual right versus left culture war that oftentimes clouds judgment, a natural conflict between democracy and the machinations of the system's experts the people in charge who knew better. Sure, the Democratic will wanted Bernie, but the people who knew better, the people who were in charge of keeping the information and the narrative under control, they knew that America would really benefit from a Biden or Harris administration. And so that was the eventual choice, and the left wing, for whatever other principles they may or may not hold to, simply fell in line. In effect, what happened was that the activists on the left fell into two pitfalls. First, a general misunderstanding about democracy itself. Democracy itself is a function of process. Who wins elections comes down to small margins, small days, details of how elections are carried out, and also, very importantly, details of how votes are counted. 
who emerges victorious after a long, persistent political slog through a quote-unquote democratic process has as much to do with the specific ways the election was carried out as it does with the demographics that actually showed up and voted. Small details in process, event, and narrative of mainstream news outlets makes all of the difference. Furthermore, in a highly contested political engagement, the popular will does not operate in isolation. There need to be people who guide it. There need to be people who ultimately hold the power. As the left, it seems, is never fully capable of understanding, it is these third parties that are ultimately in charge. And as it currently stands, a left crying for more democracy is not really challenging the status quo if they do not have any institution to ultimately transfer the power to. That isn't some repetition of the standard status quo woke corporations, woke NGOs, non-elected government, or the mainstream political democratic party. At the end of the day, the iron law of oligarchy holds, and the only oligarchy the left is currently recognizing are the oligarchs that currently rule. The Democratic Party had a choice between democracy and expert rule, and as always is the case, the left folded and got on board with the narrative. But before any of us are too critical of the left, we would all do to remember, how could we forget it in January of 2021, that a very similar set of events occurred in November. Now, of course, the YouTube terms of service prevent me from giving any details about these events, but suffice to say, the same questions about process, vote counting, and the specific nature of how the election was carried out came up and were ultimately determined by a set of experts deeply invested in the institutions of the mainstream. Not surprisingly, what emerged at the end of the electoral process was an unconditional victory for the mainstream's preferred candidate, Joe Biden, and his vice president, Kamala Harris. Was this so unpredictable? Was this so odd? Not to myself, and not to many other dissidents, either on the left or the right. But here particularly, I think the real party shocked by the ascendancy of Joe Biden was not the left or the dissidents, but really the true believers in MAGA, the people who thought that Donald Trump and indeed the populist version of the electoral process would set everything right again. Very ironically, the only lever of power left to standard red America in the form of the MAGA peds was the same lever of power so commonly praised by the left who despised them, the lever of democracy. But in 2020, we saw how useless this lever actually was. It was not connected to any sort of god of democracy who would dispense justice, but simply to another apparatus of the mainstream. It tugged on one of their long-standing promises, a promise that they were fairly at liberty to bend or even break due to the extraordinary circumstances they felt they were under. And, to add insult to injury for the MAGA crowd, and to incorporate some events that we now know from January of 2021, Red America would soon learn that none of the bad behavior or hypocrisy commonly excused when performed by the far left would have any kind of tolerance by the mainstream upon victory. The mainstream left, in the form of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, are by no means magnanimous. They are there to do a job. They are there to restore the power of the status quo, and that, their first priority, will suffer no aggression against it. And after all of this, full circle, we arrive at the conclusion of 2020, a year in which the mainstream informational and governing apparatuses made mistake after mistake and plunged this entire country into chaos and into an unending lockdown with no clear leadership or end. Yet still, after all events are tallied, the same mainstream emerges more powerful and more secure in that power than it ever was to begin with. 2020 was a year in which the left raged and protested for liberty and for equality, in which it made gains that it never thought were possible in previous years, and in which the far left galvanized and recruited more young people than it ever had in years past. Yet at the end of it, America is more unequal and less free than it's ever been. 
2020 was the year in which Make America Great Again ultimately failed. The dreams of any kind of restoration of the old order were cast into the sands of history, and the distance, while well vindicated in many of their predictions, have to admit, at the end of the day, that they have no real plan going forward. They have no avenue by which to take power, by which to make political formulas work. In other words, what resulted from the year 2020 was a political paradox, an inversion in the way that we usually think government and power should work. The general conception of governance, where power flows to those who make better predictions and who govern more competently, was in many ways inverted. So too was the notion that political power was obtained to achieve discrete policy results. Instead, for the most part, in 2020, it seemed political power was used primarily to accrue more political power, with little positive effect on the direction of the future or the governance of the polity in the present day. Once more, I think this all makes a lot more sense once you put it under the lens of the political formula. What matters isn't so much principles, it's not even political objectives, it's narratives that people use, and more importantly, use to perpetuate their power at a micro and macro scale. The two big winners in 2020 were the mainstream and the left. Both saw their political capital and their political stars rising. And this might be odd, considering ostensibly both groups have contrary aims. One is firmly establishmentarian and favors the status quo. The other is revolutionary and sees itself as a disruptive force. But despite being opposed in ultimate objectives, the mainstream and the left political factions in modern Western politics share one key component that makes them at some level symbiotic, and that is they both benefit from the same political narratives. The left, more than anything else, loves oppression narratives and likes to see itself as the victim. But ultimately, its own utopianism, along with its own dissatisfaction and hatred of small-scale, ordered institutions that largely frame people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis, force it to conceptualize its own political enemies as very large, non-specific political entities that simultaneously can be found everywhere and have also existed at all times in human history. For the most part, one can listen to an anarchist complain endlessly about the state and capitalism without it ever reaching a point where that leftist anger is directed towards the actual bureaucrats that rule government, or even some institution as concrete as the IMF, the World Economic Forum, or the World Bank. The leftist objections, the leftist hatred is fundamentally too large to be specified in any temporal sense, and this works very well for the mainstream, who's long been in bed with these very institutions that rule our world. On paper, there should be no cooperation between these two groups, yet they always seem to work in tandem when it comes down to practical politics. The ultimate war that at some point should manifest between the mainstream and the left always seems pushed off to some far distant time that never really emerges as an immediate political reality. The left fights the mainstream's enemies on the right, and in exchange, the mainstream gives the left symbolic and emotional victories that satisfy the activists and make it seem to everyone like we're slowly moving towards the revolution, like we're slowly moving towards the world of John Lennon's Imagine. And this relationship works all the better if the symbolic victory is granted to the left result in costs or destruction to traditional objects like the family, cultural coherency, and national borders. The small bonds and small relationships that hold together local and traditional communities and have long been a thorn in the side of global capital accumulation. Furthermore, the left's emotional dedication to concepts like democracy and materialism carryovers from the Enlightenment that seem less and less relevant these days, in my opinion, allow for a certain kind of predictable process of left-wing activism that always makes it necessary for mainstream experts to be brought in to both clean up the messes and also to determine what is true and what is not. As I'm often wont to say, what really divides us in politics are not questions of fact, but questions of value. 
and this has always been an obstacle for people who carried an exaggerated version of the Enlightenment values for democracy and science. After all, neither of these two objects can make any statement of value, and as such, when we appeal to democracy and science, we are usually appealing to some class of experts who speak for these objects. And inevitably, these priests, these prophets, these speakers for science and democracy will obviously be experts trained by the mainstream itself. There will be experts for monetary policy and immigration, for climate change and anti-racism, each one getting their degree from an Ivy League and studying next to and rubbing elbows with the future leaders of Goldman Sachs and the World Bank. The future of left-wing leadership is never hard to predict. It's always some version of the mainstream, with slightly more leftist perspectives mixed in gradually. But at any rate, I'm getting ahead of myself. Probably more could be said here about the symbiotic relationship between the mainstream and the left, and how it plays into both the mainstream and the left's seemingly endless anti-fragility. But all this is to really neglect the other side of the equation, the losers in 2020. Namely, both the mainstream magapied conservatives and those who consider themselves distants, both reactionaries and others on the outs of all other political factions. To a certain degree, both of these parties shared political narratives, at least insofar as their core enemies were concerned. Still, when it comes down to their perspective on 2020, they couldn't be more different. The Magapedes were fundamentally optimistic, seeing an America that was being reborn in the image of Donald Trump and really never leaving this vision for a second, even when things appeared to be getting really dark. All in all, the Magapede base was energized, but their predictions were all wrong. COVID-19, far from just blowing over, actually did turn out to be a real thing. And the lockdowns, even when questionably effective at stopping the spread of the virus, never really led up. And that mainstream Democratic candidate Joe Biden, the one that's hassy now and who could never win against an energized Donald Trump, well, he's now just being sworn in as president in January of 2021. As always, I have to admire the optimism of the MAGA people, but the world that they describe just isn't the world we're living in. Not last year, at least. By contrast, many of the distant intellectuals were able to predict many things that occurred in 2021, and their concept of how politics actually does work was vindicated again and again. But for all the knowledge, nothing more could really be accomplished, because none of those predictions or realism ever translated into an effective political formula. I suppose at this point, people like myself could always retreat to the point that the distant right and reactionary ideas were more or less purely a descriptive movement, were more or less an intellectual phenomenon. But even as an intellectual phenomenon, most of the ideas described by the dissidents, most of the ideas described on my very own channel, are quickly going past their expiration date, not really because they were wrong, but because they are, at this point, all too obvious. When I initially set out to make this video, 2020 and After Action Report, I started by creating a list of key lessons we all learned in 2020. However, halfway through, I had to stop myself because I felt I was in serious danger of boring my audience to death, or at least failing that, insulting their intelligence. But just to include this as a lightning round, hey guys, stop me if you haven't heard any one of these lessons a thousand times before, or if their reality hasn't been painfully obvious to you. 1. The claim of technocrats to be competent rulers and good predictors of reality based on the science they love so much is bullshit. Their expertise and competence would frequently underperform actions taken out of plain common sense and their scientific credentials are very rarely used for actual science and are more frequently used as a cover-your-ass measure to cover up their own mistakes and failed predictions under volumes of citations and jargon. 2. The pretense that the public square, or democracy writ large, is hosting some kind of 
crude intellectual conversation about how we manage policy and how we come to conclusions about how our society is managed is utterly hogwash. The conversation ordinary people engage in is managed and curated. The decisions made by government are usually formed by bureaucrats or, in the worst case, NGOs. And insofar as any conversation occurs on a grand collective scale, it's usually manufactured by our media. 3. There is no line that progressives will stop at. There is no common sense that holds them in line. I'd really offer even a little bit of explanation for this if it wasn't made obvious by any of the actions by protesters over the summer of 2020, or more telling yet, the tepid reaction and pushback they get from any mainstream governors or mainstream mayors of these progressive metropolitan or state areas. 4. Claims of hypocrisy and iniquity when made by conservatives or dissidents against progressives are utterly useless. No such claims will ever be entertained or will ever result in any kind of political movement unless they come directly from a progressive left, or mainstream client group. Once more, I feel this should be more or less obvious at this point, but is anyone else getting tired of the constant refrain of hypocrisy coming from conservatives? Sure, the hypocrisy is egregious, but I for one think we need to stop training ourselves to care, at least so my ears can stop bleeding from constantly hearing again and again and again how hypocritical the left and mainstream media actually is. And this, I suppose, brings me to number five, the penultimate conclusion, and the one that I think is settling now most deeply on the mainstream MAGA conservatives, even though it's been more or less apparent to distance for quite some time now. And this is the conclusion that the old America, the America we knew, along with the promises that that country made, is now thoroughly over. Perhaps this is just us moving out of the denial stage of the grieving process, and I'm certain there will still be people who want to go back. But I don't think we can go back to the way things were before 2020 or before 2012. The only way out is through. And if there isn't a non-progressive who's thinking in this way at this point, they're setting themselves up for even harder lessons in the future. But as bitter a pill as this is to swallow, I suppose for myself, there is one obvious lesson of 2020 that even I didn't fully foresee when this year began. And that is the plain fact, constant throughout human existence, that a mechanical understanding of a problem is not itself sufficient to solve that problem. Perhaps that is the epitaph to be written on the gravestone of neo-reaction, just as certainly as hypocrisy doesn't matter is written on the gravestone of mainstream conservatism. By not understanding each of these lessons, and more importantly, not coming out with solutions to them, both the magapede mainstream conservatives and the reactionary distance were the real losers of 2020, and unless they change radically in the coming years, they will be the losers every year in the future. Once more, before I put a capstone on this video, perhaps I could leave my viewers and listeners with something a little bit more fresh. What are the prospects going forward for each of these groups? Have things really changed? And is the position of the mainstream and the left really as unassailable as it seems right now? Well, ultimately, I can't answer this. I'll try to provide some perspective. To start with the perspectives going forward for the mainstream, far from being unassailable, I think this group has a lot of problems. As shown across the last two decades, its ultimate vision of a neoliberal future, of a technocratic future, is increasingly looking totally unworkable with how humans exist and want to operate in the world. The morality and aesthetic vision it has are little more than old leftist platitudes that don't match up with reality and inspire nobody. Furthermore, for a political group that justifies its own power through competence and expertise, there is an unavoidable realization coming for most people that our current leaders are utterly ineffective. They are growing less and less competent each year, 
and indeed the problem seems to be metastasizing. For so long, calling in the experts and calling in the jargon speakers was enough to keep everyone, especially the radicals, in line. But does anyone fall for that whole game anymore after one year of barely effective COVID lockdowns? And as those explanations wear thin, I think the mainstream leaders will come under increasing fire, not just from the dreaded right, but also from the left. And does the mainstream even have a good way of dealing with leftist radicals? Ultimately, the solution to left-wing radicals for the mainstream was always historically to point at some scary boogeyman on the right wing. Hey kids, don't attack us, attack the scary Nazis who want to take away your rights. But after 2020, is there really a very realistic villain that can fill this role? Geriatric neo-Nazis and washed-out 4chan trolls is pretty thin gruel, ultimately. And beyond pointing to a common enemy, I'm not so sure that there is really a better solution to keep the mainstream and the left politically on the same page. Narratively, the challenge for the mainstream in 2021 is to come up with some variation on the narratives they already used. They need to somehow obliterate the distance on the right so that they don't provide a viable alternative to their power structures, to the life they're promising people, but at the same time keep them around in a prominent and scary enough way to motivate their activist base and to keep the otherwise anti-corporate left off their backs. Obviously, I wouldn't put this political formula necessarily past the abilities of spin doctors in the mainstream, but if their competence is decreasing just like everyone else in our contemporary leadership, I think that this particular story is going to be a tough sell. But for all of the problems with the mainstream going forward in 2021, in some ways they're a lot easier to manage than the problems on the left. Here, as I speak in 2021, the left is the main beneficiary to an increasingly radicalized form of politics that's played out over the last 12 months. Not only that, with the defeat of Donald Trump and with many mainstream leaders bending the knee to their own symbols, a lot of activists on the left feel like they have the wind in their sails. The problem is, nothing else about their coalition or their objectives really makes any sense. As always, the primary problem with the left, the perennial wrench in the spanner, is that their ultimate vision is totally impossible and in places totally incoherent. To put it bluntly, their vision for humanity's future is fantasy, and sometimes fantasy that can't even be represented consistently inside the human mind. Of course, it's convinced a lot of people to fight for this fantasy, and I suppose one religious vision is as good as any other. But I wouldn't wonder if the left's sudden political success in 2020 hasn't caused it to overlook a lot of problems that are coming up. As always, since it symbiotically shares narratives with the mainstream, a lot of leftists still have to come to terms with the fact that they are more or less surfing the same mainstream capitalist institutions, the same establishmentarianisms that they're supposed to be trying to tear down. Defeating a right-wing populist movement feels good for a little while until you realize that that is not really the machine you were trying to rage against. Furthermore, the coalition itself based now on identity politics, is increasingly unstable. Most of its white base is fixated on some idea of communism that is going to need to see immediate future progress in terms of material gains. Opposing them, always present but hardly ever mentioned, are the large contingencies of non-white activists, who are, for the most part, much less ideological and in some cases even have reactionary and nationalistic tendencies themselves. As such, there is virtually no political objective, once honestly stated, that could keep these people fighting under the same roof, at the moment when they lack some common enemy to loot together. But for myself, even this isn't the real problem. The real problem with the left is the manifest harm they cause to people through their own recommendations and the lifestyles that they promote. In some sense, the left is the ultimate ambulance chaser of ideologies. The degeneration and destruction of the individual life is its political fuel. But in addition to benefiting from destroyed human life, it also encourages it. 
Increasingly, the people living the ideal left-wing activist urban lifestyle are going to realize that they are living squalid lives with very little hope and very little to look forward to outside of victories in the political movement. Sure, this can be partially hidden in a movement that's supposedly losing, but what happens when that movement starts winning? People might look at their own lives a lot more critically, and that will result in a lot of very difficult questions. In 2021, and in all other years going forward, the left is going to have to come up with a political formula, or some set of political formulas that answers all of these questions. It has to effectively bully the mainstream into carrying out its agenda while maintaining its coalition and also escaping accountability for the manifest failures of its own agenda. Once more, I can't imagine how this political formula is going to come into existence without some external enemy that they can blame everything on, and that will motivate their coalition to remain in one piece. But all of this is academic. After all, most of the people watching this video are going to be coming from either a conservative or a distant point of view, and as such, the narrative problems of the mainstream and the left really aren't any of our concerns. But the pertinent question remains. What can we, as non-progressives, do to make sure 2021 and subsequent years turn out better. In some sense, the failure of 2020 puts us at a very opportune turning point. Both branches of counter-progressive ideology are coming to an end and are looking for a way to remake themselves. And so I think it's worth to spend a little time on the problems faced by the right and the possible political formulas and narratives it could use going forward. To put it briefly, the problems for the political right are that it has virtually no institutional support at this moment. It also has no unifying political or cultural narrative internationally, as, say, intersectionality would for both the left and the mainstream. And both of these problems are only complemented by the fact that the right, in both its conservative and distant form, are quickly becoming the scapegoat for both the mainstream and the left's political and narrative problems. Any narrative approach any new right-wing movement will take going forward will have to confront each of these problems in turn and find a way to get around them. In addition to adhering to the classic reactionary rule not to occupy the frame of the enemy, the new narratives will have to stand and directly contradict the narrative framework of the enemy. Here I think I can offer three forms that any new, non-progressive ideology will have to occupy. Three things that any dissident or non-progressive will have to say about themselves in order to gain foothold, in order to make a political formula work. The first narrative that a new right will have to have is the narrative of being the dissident, of being the rebel. This, of course, as a narrative strategy, is nothing new. The image of the dissident and the rebel have had a long place in the romantic mythology of the West and in many other cultures. And indeed, many contemporary right-wingers have even attempted to try on this strategy from time to time in decades past, and it's never really worked. I would suggest here that we haven't been trying it in the right way. In order to be a distant and a rebel, we need to fully occupy the mode of the distant and rebel in our own minds. We can't be comfortable with the status quo. We can't accept things as they are, And we also can't be completely stuck in the past. The notion of the romantic rebel is many things, heroic commonly, poetic in a sense, but he is always future-looking. Even if he takes some things from the past, the eyes of the romantic distant are always cast towards the horizon. And that's something that conservatives, at least, have never really taken on board. We need more dreamers and less nostalgists. We need more artists and poets and fewer humorous curmudgeons and cranks. Of course, the past does need to play a role in our dreams, but the inescapable problem is that few people look at right-wingers or most non-progressives and see dreamers, and this makes them fundamentally uncomfortable in the role of the distant. And at this point, I can anticipate an objection. 
well, even if we are going to be dreamers, even if we are going to be starry-eyed rebels, isn't there already a ready-made narrative for this? A ready-made narrative that condemns the reactionary rebels, traitors to an equitable order, and really only crusading for a dream that can never occur. Certainly, at least in the American context, this language is already ready to go. But this brings me to the second narrative I think right-wingers need to occupy in the future, and that is the narrative of being the carriers and advocates of beauty. Of course, be beautiful or live a beautiful life is kind of a stupid piece of advice to give anyone, or even a political movement. We all strive to be beautiful and live better. But here, what I really want to emphasize is our approach to politics, and in particular, political culture. For a while, in my opinion, right-wingers and non-progressives have been approaching culture all wrong. Of course, there's a simple demographic fact that right-wingers make up a smaller percentage of artists. But even as critics, I've noticed a trend in right-wing media to always be taking the worst elements of the left. There's a tendency to analyze a piece of media, to deconstruct its ideology, to criticize it, but never to really advocate for something larger, a larger beauty that might lie behind that work of art. After all, you can't argue people out of aesthetic positions, and so most criticism of art in that regard is kind of silly, and I say that knowing full well that I have done that myself. But when it comes to art appreciation and art criticism, I just want to flip this perspective completely on its head. Whether you're a content creator or not, whether you're a creator or someone who just likes consuming culture for entertainment purposes, make yourself, as much as possible, an ally and advocate for beauty wherever it is and in whatever form it could take. If something is beautiful, truly beautiful, then there must be an element of truth in it, and therefore there is an element that cannot be bent into the narrow corridors of political ideology. As such, every element of beauty, whether it is in a progressive work of art, a conservative work of art, a communist work of art, or a reactionary work of art, is in some sense an ideological ally for people who seek the ultimate thriving of the human race which, in my honest opinion, are the non-progressives. And the step that is honestly needed is for us to teach ourselves to appreciate beauty in a much more innocent and blithe way. We have nothing to fear about an honest pursuit of this concept, even when it crosses ideological lines. We need fewer people criticizing art for containing implicit progressive messages, and more people looking for the hidden kernel of truth and goodness inside the crudest of progressive and liberal propaganda. Whereas the former seeks to argue against an aesthetic choice, the latter seeks to bring something out, to augment and highlight something of beauty, and to make the world a better place, even in a small way. And I think this will be made all the more powerful in a political sense just due to the plain fact that the progressive mainstream and left is losing their own handle on what is beautiful and what is not. Which brings me to my last narrative frame. I think that people on the right and non-progressive side of things should consider going forward. And that is the narrative of surviving, of being the representation of healthy and fulfilled humanity. Of course, Having just made a video several weeks ago about personal life advice, I won't belabor the point here, but I do believe a core part of our political mission is through life improvement, is through making our own small worlds a representation of the order and human thriving we seek to achieve at a larger scale. This, I think, is a bulwark against the hardest narrative vilifications, when your opponents have to make themselves the enemies of both truth and beauty when they try to vilify you and use you as a scapegoat, you are in simply a better position. And furthermore, for what it's worth, the non-progressive side of things just is better at generating people who live better lives. The mainstream globalist liberal institutions 
combined with the left itself, is generating an entire generation of broken people living ugly and depressing lives. And the non-progressive political side of things can be the great alternative to this, providing some other vision of how humans can live, and possibly even a path forward to redemption and reform. As such, I think people's own missions for regeneration and recovery, far from being self-indulgent, are of core interests to anyone who wants to see a new political order spring forward. The whole notion of becoming worthy and then ruling is so often repeated it is a painful cliché, and while the statement as a political formula simply doesn't work, it is true that in order to ride the tiger, in order to get through our current epoch to one more hopeful one, we have to in some sense step around the poison that is waiting for us, step around the trap that is placed before our feet by modernity itself. And that very simple action is as tall an order as any. I know at the end of this video, at least, I haven't come forward with any substantial plan of action, but I really don't think some substantial plan of action is really what's needed at this particular moment. I do think that the work I do on this channel talking about politics is valuable, but given the events of this year and other life events for myself, I long have been considering a certain transformation, a certain shift of focus to gravitate towards these more central and eternal truths. Politics, in a descriptive sense, is always interesting, but I here don't want to be continuously involved in explaining the physics of our own decline and doom. I want to be part of the solution. I want to offer something that can genuinely help my listeners and viewers. And I think in order to do this, I need to focus on embodying the narratives that I just laid out here. After all, if there is any one piece of eternal human wisdom that's been well underlined by the events of 2020, it is that change is inevitable. And one has to change their own patterns of life to meet these ever-changing challenges. And for anyone else listening to this video, distant or otherwise, I think you should be considering some kind of change as well. Because under our current circumstances, it's worth considering. 2020, in all of our retrospectives, is being called the worst year ever. And certainly, relative to the other years in my lifetime, we have had more than our fair share of human suffering over the last 12 months. But it is only in our failure to really learn from our mistakes, to really change accordingly, to adopt to the new reality, that the year of our Lord 2020 could change from being simply a bad period of time to, in a historical sense, a true human tragedy.